But for all his activity, nothing made Uncle Pio rich. One would have said that the abandoned of a venture when it threatened to prosper. Although no one knew it, he owned a house. It was full of dogs that could add and multiply to the top floor. It was reserved for birds, but even in this kingdom he was lonely and proud of his loneliness, as though there resided a certain superiority in such a solitude. Finally, he stumbled upon an adventure that came like a strange gift from a skies and that combined three great aims of his life. His passion for overseeing the lives of others, his worship of beautiful women, and his admiration for the treasures of Spanish literature. He discovered Camelia Procole. Her real name was Marcelia Villegas. She was singing in cafes at the age of 12, and Uncle Pio had always been a fairy soul of cafes. Now he sat upon, among the guitarists and watched this awkward girl singing ballads, intimidating every reflection of a more experienced singer who had preceded her. The determination entered his mind to play the polymagon. He bought her. Instead of sleeping locked up in a wine bin, she inherited a cot in his house. He wrote songs for her and taught her how to listen to the quality of her tone and bought her a new dress. At first, all she noticed was that it was wonderful not to be whipped, to be offered hot soups, and to be taught something. But it was Uncle Pio who was really dazzled. His rash experiment flourished beyond all prophecy. The little twelve-year-old, silent and always a little sullen, devoured work. He set her endless exercises in acting and mimicry. He set her problems in conveying the atmosphere of a song. He took her to the theaters and made her notice all the details of, perf of a performance. But it was from Camelia as a woman that he was to receive his greatest shock. The long arms and legs were finally harmonized into the body of, body of perfect grace. An almost grotesque and hungry face became beautiful. Her whole nature became gentle and mysterious and oddly wise, and it all turned to him. She could finally find no fault in him, and she was suddenly sturdily loyal. They loved one another, deeply but without passion. He respected the sight of nervous shadow that crossed her face when he came too near her. But there arose, out of this denial itself, the perfume of tenderness, that ghost of passion which, in the most unexpected relationship, can make even the whole lifetime devoted to irksome duty pass like a gracious dream. They traveled a great deal, sinking new taverns for the highest attribute of a cafe singer was always her novelty. They went to Mexico, their old clothes wrapped up in self-same salt. They slept on beaches, they were whipped at Panama, and shipwrecked on some tiny Pacific island, plastered with the droppings of birds. They tramped through jungles, delicately picking up their way along snakes and beetles. They sold themselves out as harvesters in the late hard season. Nothing in the world was surprising to them. Then began the even harder course of training for the girl, a regiment that resembled more preparation for an acrobat. The instruction was little, complicated by the fact that her rise of favor was very rapid, and there seemed some danger in the applause she received would make her content with her work too soon. Uncle Pio never exactly beat her, but he resorted to sarcasm, which had its own terrors. At the close of a performance, Camelia would return to her dressing room and find Uncle Pio whistling nonchalantly in one corner. She would divine his attitude at once and cry angrily. No, what is that, Mother of God? Mother of God, what is it now? Nothing, little Pearl, my little Camelia of Camelias, nothing. There was something you didn't like. Ugly, fault-finding thing that you are. Come on now, what was it? Look, I'm ready. No, little fish, adorable morning star. I suppose you did as well as you could. The suggestion that she was a limited artist had certain felicities that would be forever close to her never failed to make Camilla frantic. She would burst into tears. I wish I had never known you. You poisoned my whole life. You just think I did badly. It pleases you pretend that I was bad. All right, then be quiet. Uncle Pio went on whistling. The fact is, I know I was too weak tonight, and I don't need you to tell me so. So there. Now go away. I don't want you to see me around. It's hard enough to play that part without coming back and finding you this way. 
Suddenly, Uncle Pio would learn, lean forward and ask with angry intensity, Why did you take that speech to the prisoner so fast? More tears from the Bacole. Oh, God, let me die in peace. One day you tell me to go faster, another to go slower. Anyway, I shall be crazy in a year or two, and then it won't matter. More whistling. Besides, the audience applauded as never before. Do you hear me? As never before. There. Too fast or too slow is nothing to them. They wept. I was divine. That's all I care for. Now be silent. Be silent. He was absolutely silent. You may comb your hair. But if you say another word, I shall never play again. You can find some other girl, that's all. Thereupon, he would comb her hair soothingly for ten minutes, pretending not to notice the sobs that were shaking her exhausted body. At last, she would return and, catching one of his hands, would kiss it frantically. Uncle Pio, was I so bad? Was I a disgrace to you? Was it so awful that you left the theater? After a long pause, Uncle Pio would admit judiciously, you were good in the sense on the ship. But I've been better, Uncle Pio. You remember the night you came back from Cusco? You were pretty good at the clothes. Was I? But my flower, my pearl, what was the matter in the speech to the prisoner? Here the Piccoli would fling her face and arms upon the table amid the pomades, caught up on the tremendous fit of weeping. Only perfection would do, only perfection. And that had never come. Then, beginning in a low voice, Uncle Pio would talk for an hour, analyzing the play, entering in a world of finesse and matters of voice and gesture and tempo, and often until dawn they would remain there, declaiming one another in the lordly conversation of Calderon. Whom were these two seeking to please? Not the audiences of Lima. They had long been since satisfied. We come into a world where we have known incredible standards of excellence. We dimly remember the beauties which have not been seized again, and we go back to that world. Uncle Pila and Camellia Percoli were astonished. They tormented themselves into an effort of established in Peru, the standards of theater and some heaven whither Calderon had preceded them. The public for which masterpieces are intended is not on this earth. With the passing of time, Camellia lost uh, some of this absorption in her heart. A certain intermittent contempt for acting made her negligent. It was due to the poverty and incest in women's roles throughout Spanish classical drama. At a time when the playwrights grouped about the courts of England and France, and a little later of Venice, were enriching the parts of women with studies in wit, charm, passion, and historia, the dramatists of Spain kept their eyes on the heroes, on gentlemen torn between conflicts of claiming honor or as sinners returning to the last moment to the cross. For a number of years, Uncle Pio sent himself in discovering ways to interest the Bercoli in roles that fell to her. Upon one occasion, he was able to announce to Camellia that a granddaughter of the Viso di Barela had arrived in Peru. Uncle Pio had long since communicated to Camilla. His veneration for the great poets of Camilla never questioned the, the view that they were a little above kings and not below saints. So it was in great excitement that the two of them chose one of the master's plays to perform. Before his granddaughter, they remembered a poem a hundred times now in great joy. The invention now in... The, and now in dejection. On one night of the performance, Camilla peered bet out between the folds of the curtain. Had Uncle Pio point out to her a little middle-aged woman torn with the cares of perjury in a large family? But it seemed to Camilla that she was looking at all the beauty and dignity in the world.